Hey folks, good afternoon. Thanks for joining this talk. Uh, mastering security in critical software development. It's kind of a dry topic, but an important one. It's mostly about the use of C and C++ in sort of heavy industry, automotive, et cetera, and how we would actually secure that code. Because traditionally, that has been quite challenging. Um, obviously, those language ecosystems have been around for many years. Haven't evolved that much, um, but I think you know there's been recent sort of work in how we would actually secure that. And I think the genesis of this talk is really, even though you may be building code in these languages, I think you can adopt some of the modern practices of other languages um, and achieve sort of the same output around DevOps, DevSecOps. Okay. So my name is Lawrence Crowther. Uh, I run solution engineering for Sneak in Asia Pacific in Japan. As you can tell from my accent, I come from Australia. I've been in the company almost four years. If you haven't heard of, of Sneak, we're a developer-first security company, helping developers not only secure their code, but all the other components that make up what is a modern application, things like containers, cloud infrastructure, uh, open source dependencies as well. So, like I said, kind of a dry topic, but hopefully I can make it interesting to, for you. <laughs> so let's go. So first, I thought this was appropriate for, for the Japan market, given there's a lot of reliance on C and C++ here, automotive, manufacturing, and operational uh, technology. It's kind of the foundation uh, for a lot of those industries. And there is a reason why folks use it, obviously, because it's reliable, performant, lightweight uh, machine code. Uh, versus other languages, right? But there's a lot of benefits you get out of it, and there's a lot of power that you get with it, but obviously there are some inherent challenges with it as well, which is obviously what, what this talk is, is about. Um, I got this image from mid-journey. It was pretty good, although I put C+, not C++ in the middle there, <laughs> if you can notice, but not bad, actually, from the AI. I tried to incorporate automotive and uh, manufacturing, etc. All right, so what are some of the challenges with C, C and C++? Um, by the way, just by way of background, I spent sort of 20 years in software development. I did a lot of C and C++ early on in my career. To be honest with you, I haven't done a lot recently. I'm focusing more on the security side of code, but it um, be interesting to see your perspective if you're actually still building it today. So the first one, is uh, historically there's been sort of niche tools, right? And it, this, the learning curve has been quite steep for new developers coming into the project uh, and sort of lack of standard frameworks, et cetera, make it difficult um, to be productive sort of from day one, right? I think you'd probably agree with that. Slow developer workflows, because sometimes the sort of compilation, integration path is, is uh, clunky, for lack of a better word, complex. Um, you can see lots of integrations, lots of dependencies that you need to sort of put into your build path, which results in slowing developers down, right? And then probably the most important one is lack of safety features. A again, you have to remember that you know, C is over 50 years old, right? And I think C++ is over 40 years old. So and they were built in a different era, right? Um, and as, as I said, they haven't evolved that much in terms of safety features. Some people love that, right? They love the absolute power they can get as close to the bare metal as, as possible. But obviously, newer developers, if you haven't used those languages extensively, you, know, you can get into trouble pretty quickly, right? As you'll see, I'll go through some example breaches that have happened from um, sort of misuse, I guess, of, of some of the code. Does that make sense? Cool. So, and this may be like going back to university or school, because I remember doing this in, in, um, in uni, <laughs> but some of the common vulnerabilities, or mistakes, they, let's face it, they, they're a bug, but they can have catastrophic security implications as well, right? Buffer overflow, uh, this is where your 
writing memory outside the bounds of your intended bounds of your data structures, right? Because the way that the C compiler, C++ compiler is allocating memory, if you've got two arrays next to each other, you could actually write over data, which obviously can have some serious implications. I'll give some examples as well. Um, memory leaks, obviously this is a big one in, in C and C++ where memory is allocated but not deallocated. And this, was, this one is harder to pick up during sort of development testing phases because obviously if you're starting up the, the runtime and shutting it down, you may not see some of the side effects of actually running out of memory, but you would in production, okay? Um, so they, they, these things seem seemingly basic, but as you'll see later, it's still happening in the, in the wild, right? Um, after 50 years of development, we're still seeing these problems occur. And they have, you know, severe consequences to critical systems. Okay, so buffer overflow, basic example. Um, this is just a command line program. It's taking user input for a password, okay? And it defines a input array of, a char input array of eight. Now, if, if the user puts in anything less than eight characters, then it will work as expected, whether you, if you got the password right or wrong, it will deny or grant access. However, because of this line where you're just taking all the input from the, from the command line until the, you, the user presses enter, um, some nasty things may occur. If, if you have a string that's over eight characters, because of the way the compiler works, it will override the password array. So you can see the input and the password arrays are sort of defined next to each other. Uh, they're right next to each other in memory. Um, and if an astute attacker was to sort of um, find out that you have a buffer overflow issue, they could just put repeat the same eight character password twice and they would get granted access, right? Simple example, but just really to prove a point. And I think you know, in terms of C++ coding examples, try to avoid some of the primitives in the language, you know, um, star, char, and um, in interrays, et cetera, and use high level functions like standard string, standard vector, et cetera. Easy fix, right? If we change this to a standard string, and then obviously we need to compare it, we need to convert it to a character array again, but very easy fix, but like obviously to a novice developer that they may not be that apparent straight away, right? Memory leak is even simpler. Um, we're calling the allocate memory, and which in turn calls malloc, right, to dynamically allocate a memory space, but never releases the memory. Uh, and all we need to do really is, is, is free up the memory space on that, on that pointer. Very simple. What's interesting with this one, a bit of a side note, if you look closely, you can see a little squiggly line on the left-hand side under malloc, right? So that was in my VS Code IDE where the sneak, sneak plugin has actually detected a, a problem right there. It's kind of like, you know, spell checking as I write the code. But more interesting, it offered an, an, a fix through the, the AI generation. So I was able to fix that. Now, I, I haven't done C++ for a while, so I wasn't quite sure how to fix it but the AI suggested putting that additional line 10 in to, to fix the problem. So as a side note, that was quite nice, right? It, I think what it emphasizes is you need to have these security tools inside the IDE as you're writing code, right? I think especially if you're using things like Copilot or, or uh, Google Gemini these days for the AI code assistance, you want to be able to trap those issues straight away. So. You may have heard of this. I'm going to talk about some sort of well-known ex examples. Heartbleed from uh, 2014 was a critical uh, vulnerability in OpenSSL, which pretty much broke the internet, right? Um, it was a buffer overflow in the C++. Um, what it would enable, enable attackers to do is sort of decrypt uh, information and, and steal passwords and usernames, et cetera. I think the biggest breach, if you remember, was Yahoo with 500 million uh, passwords compromised in Heartbleed. Uh, other companies were 
uh, Dropbox, GitHub, and uh, Instagram, for example. Uh, so this, this affected 66% of actual websites at, at the time. Um, and even sort of six months after, 500,000 websites still had not been patched, right? So this was pretty widespread. Another one is Cloud Bleed, uh, the, the CDN or the Content Delivery Network Cloudflare had a similar issue, this time in, a, in their HTML parser. Again, another buffer overflow. This time, 3,500 uh, customers were, were affected. And I think 4.8 million uh, credentials were, were leaked, right, in this data exposure. Companies like Uber, 1Password, and a Fitbit uh, were, were compromised. And the stock price of Cloudflare jumped, jumped by 10 to, uh, sorry, dropped by 10 to 15% as a result of that. And they faced sanctions from, you know, regulatory bodies as well. So from a small, you know, issue in the C++ code to this massive problem, right? And you can see sort of where I'm going with that. And then in the automotive industry as well, um, four use cases here, so, some of which weren't actual breaches, there were more researchers who disclosed vulnerabilities. Um, Tesla, for example, researchers were able to bypass the keyless system in, in uh, 2019 and gain un unauthorized access uh, to, to the vehicle. Obviously, mostly C++ code in Tesla. Um, the Fiat one actually was hackers remotely controlling the infotainment uh, system, Uconnect, and were able to sort of remotely control the engine uh, brakes and steering, right? <laughs> um, which is pretty nasty. And then similar ones with Volkswagen and BMW, again, from a uh, buffer overflow vulnerability in the telematics system, um, they were able to run remote code execution on the, on the actual uh, vehicle, right? This is why there's sort of new standards for specifically in the automotive industry um, to sort of introduce safety into C and C++. So there's something called MISRA, stands for Motor Industry Software Reliability, Association, which has many hundreds of rules to help. It's kind of like the OWASP uh, equivalent, but specifically for, for motor industry. But also, it can apply to sort of manufacturing and other critical infrastructure as well. Um, but I encourage you to check that out if you're, if you're working in automotive. Some of the rules that it, it talks about, uh, no dynamic memory uh, for greater sort of predictability. No recursion, I found this one quite interesting, actually, because I remember when I first started doing C++, recursion was awesome. Like, uh, it solved a lot of different use cases for, tra for traversing like a tree map structure, what have you. Um, but I can kind of see why it could cause issues, right? Because if you have some unusual behavior and the recursion never exits, obviously you're gonna have nasty side effects, right? And then, this one is interesting as well. All functions must be used, meaning if there's a methods or uh, functions and classes in there that aren't actually reachable or e executed, uh, then remove them. Right? I guess that's more of a maintain maintenance thing, but I guess you could say that if there's like dormant code sitting in your servers uh, and you, know, you got breached or attacked, in theory, they, you could um, execute uh, malicious code in those unused packages as well, right? Okay, so other sort of um, tips for C++ safety, secure coding, use the, the, the MISRA standard, uh, as I mentioned, avoid things like buffer overflows, memory leaks. Um, don't ignore the compiler warnings. I think too many developers simply sort of move on and, and, and forget about those warnings, so they're important, right? Uh, use a static analysis tool, uh, or, or SAS static, application security testing tool, something like a sneak code that's going to uh, look for the vulnerabilities and misconfigurations in the, in the IDE, okay? Um, and then if you want, also use like a Gen AI tool to, to auto-remediate as well, to suggest fixes to, to help you um, sort of patch those uh, vulnerabilities. 
Uh, function safety, I mentioned before, use some of the higher level functions, avoid functions that actually are vulnerable. And that's pretty easy to look up on the, um, the vulnerability databases, the open source uh, MVD, for example, National Vulnerability Database. You can find some of this stuff. Uh, and then this is a big one, dependency management. So I think, uh, you know, continually scanning all the dependencies that your application has. Uh, and it's, it's quite tricky, as I'll talk about in a minute with, with C, because it's, there's no standard way of doing that. Okay, it can be binaries, it can be source code, in different directories, et cetera. Um, but you know, invest in uh, SCA, software composition analysis tools, uh, to continually scan those third parties. And a lot of the hidden complexity and, and, and uh, the vulnerabilities are in what we call transient dependencies. So the developer may be using um, you know, 10 libraries, for example. Those 10 libraries drag in another 50 libraries, right? Which end up when you deploy to production, uh, you know, is a hell of a lot more code than you started with. Okay? And that's where all the hidden vulnerabilities. Uh, we, we saw the previous speaker talk about SBOM. That's really important here as well, where it's a machine readable file. There's two formats, SPDX, Cyclone DX. SPDX is from the Linux Foundation. Cyclone DX is from OWASP Foundation. But essentially, uh, sort of defining the components of your application, of your code, uh, that you can export to your vendors, and, and your vendors can send you those as well, right? So you can ingest. So you can have a bit of safety before you release. So overcoming the dependencies sprawl. So this is, and I, I think it's still the same today. I remember writing C++ code, and the, the difficulty was managing all the dependencies uh, because there was no standard way of doing it, right? Developers can put code all over the file system, can be DLLs, can be uh, binaries, can be source code. Um, but the, the point was there's no standard way of doing it. So, uh, and they had to reserve, uh, sorry, resolve a lot of the conflicts themselves because you might have different versions of open source packages that you're not aware of, you know, causing runtime issues. Okay? So that's a whole lot of you know, libraries to sort of juggle, right? And it can, you know, very hard to manage and complex. New, new folks coming into the team, uh, there's a steep learning curve as well. So I think the, the meme sort of sums it up, right? So what I want to talk about here is a tool called Conan, which is an open source package manager. It was introduced in 2016 by JFrog, but it's pretty much the first proper uh, package manager for C++. And, and I think you can use it for C as well, where it is a standard way of defining uh, dependencies, right? So, not only is it going to reduce the complexity and, and give you better manageability, I think the even better side effect is security. Okay, so now we have one standard place where you define your uh, open source packages and versions, where an SCA tool can actually scan that and tell you any known vulnerabilities in those, in those packages. Okay? This may sound trivial and, and, and it's kind of table stakes for other languages, but you know, this has only recently been in the C++ ecosystem, right? I think, you know, Java went through a similar journey with um, jar files and, and libraries in the class path. I, I lived through that era as well. Um, but they kind of sold that 15 years ago with Maven. And most, you know, modern languages have package managers. Obviously, uh, Node.js has NPM, and Python has PyPy or PIP. Um, but yeah, that, that's, most languages have that sort of built in. But, you know, C++ is, you know, 40 years old, so obviously people weren't using open source back then. <laughs> so a bit more on Conan. Um, open source under MIT license, uh, written in, in Python, it can handle both source code and binaries, okay? Uh, hundreds of contributors on GitHub, and you can, you can generate different make files depending on what you want to use, CMake or uh, Xcode, QMake, etc. cetera. Um, and th this is an example of the manifest file, right? So this, developers would build this and put in their open source packages and version numbers. There are some other options here, that, what generators you want. Um, 
And if you've got sort of non-standard packages in, in different folders or, or in DLLs in different folders, you can um, specify where they live, right? I think that's probably mainly for legacy projects if you've got certain structures already maintained. But quite, quite flexible and um, highly, highly recommended, obviously, if you're building in C++. So that was it. That's pretty short, but um, some resources for you. Uh, if you haven't heard of Sneak, go to sneak.io. We have a podcast as well that talks about all this stuff. And then that QR code, if you want to take a photo, is to our Sneak Learn platform where um, there's a number of C++ uh, and C secure coding exercises, if you will, um, to not only learn more about some of the safety or lack of safety features in those language ecosystems, but also how Sneak can actually help you secure those as well at different parts of the um, SDLC, whether that be from a development standpoint in your IDE, in your Git repositories, in your CI CD pipelines, even in production as well. Uh, thank you. Anybody have any questions? Hi, uh, thank Hi. you for the talk. I'm Shashank. I work in uh, Sony Group Corporation. I just had a comment that uh, recently there was a safe C++ proposal which uh, aims to uh, uh, extend the C++ to a superset and, and include a safe subset which, uh, which offers the same set of uh, memory guarantees that uh, Rust offers. So hopefully that will be merged into, let's say, C++26 or the version after that, and it sees a lot of adoption. That's it. What, what was that called, sorry? Uh, the save C++ oh, proposal. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Any questions, Jeff? OK, cool. <laughs> If you're, if you're too shy to ask questions, that's okay. Come and see me um, afterwards. I'll hang around down the front here. Uh, if there's no more questions, thank you very much. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>